On this episode of Doing the Most, we're going to help you make your very first cider. There's a lot of homebrewing content out on YouTube these days, and a lot of it presumes that you're gonna start by diving in and buying a bunch of gear. Carboys and airlocks and buckets, all the stuff that you see in these videos, and if you've never brewed before, I can tell that that would kind of be intimidating. We've tried to take everything we've seen on the platform and narrow the scope, kind of remove everything that isn't absolutely necessary to brewing and use the doing the most perspective to brew very, very beginner friendly recipes. So we're gonna be doing this very differently than I normally brew. I hope if you're a very, very beginner brewer that you find this content helpful, we're gonna get you brewing with as minimal investment as possible. My goal is to get you a quick win. I want you brewing something that you can be proud of and drink in a short period of time. If you've been brewing a long time and you're watching this content thinking, why do I care about beginner stuff? Just follow along. You might see some stuff that makes you approach how you give advice to beginners differently in the future. So in this video, we're making cider and we're gonna be doing some slightly unconventional brewing practices through the course of this video series. And one of them can be a little bit dangerous if you're not paying attention. That practice is that we are not going to be using an airlock for any of these brews. Instead, we're going to just use the lid that comes with our fermentation vessel and make sure that it stays on secured, but loose so gas can escape. And then after a period of time when fermentation has slowed down, we'll start to keep it tight, but burp it a few times every single day so that way pressure doesn't build up in the fermentation vessel. This is not a commonly recommended route and it's the reason airlocks exist. They're much safer. For that reason, we recommend buying a beginner brewing kit and we recommend the craft a brew series of beginner kits. Links to those will be in the description of this video so that way you can pick one up. It comes with an airlock, which provides that level of safety. But if you're following this video to the letter, just remember to pay attention, release the pressure from your fermentation vessel regularly and avoid building up pressure that can lead to a catastrophic failure of your fermentation vessel. If you don't want to buy an airlock, but you still want kind of the insurance policy that an airlock provides, you can use a piece of your tubing from your siphon, just cut a hole in the lid of your fermentation vessel, put the tubing in and hot glue it, then run the other end of that tubing into a jar of water. That will act as a blow off, which is technically an airlock. You can also take a balloon, clean it really thoroughly, turn it inside out, poke a hole in it, put that over the top of your vessel and use that as a temporary airlock. Either method can work really great for your first couple of brews. Another thing we're not gonna talk about in this video is the hydrometer, which is arguably the most important piece of home brewing gear you can have. If you're just starting out, you might not wanna spend 10 or 12 bucks on a hydrometer, but I guarantee you it is an invaluable tool and should be the first piece of home brewing gear that you purchase. I cannot stress enough how important it is to have a hydrometer. It tells you your starting gravity and your final gravity, which helps you understand what ABV your brew is. And it tells you a little bit about the progress of your brew as you're moving through the primary stage of fermentation. And for things like wine or mead that might need to be back sweetened, it helps you create a consistent level of back sweetening batch to batch if you're working on perfecting a recipe. Now that said, I am going to talk about gravity readings and show you the alcohol by volume of the brews in this series. So don't worry, you'll have a rough estimate of the alcohol content of this brew. For this cider, we're gonna be using boiled bread yeast as our nutrient. Now typically, I recommend a nutrient called Fermade O, which is an organic form of nitrogen that serves as a great nutrient for yeast. But boiled bread yeast is an acceptable alternative and we're gonna be using it in a kind of interesting way here. We're not going to be pre-prepping it. We're going to be prepping it as part of the must that we're mixing up. To use Fermaid O, you would use a calculator online to determine how much nutrient you need and then add it by the schedule that you prefer. But when using boiled bread yeast as a nutrient, you actually need to use three times as much as you would if you were using Fermaid O. 
So I've taken all the thought out of that for you. I've calculated how much nutrient, I've done the math and come up with the quantity of bread yeast that you will need to boil to act as nutrient for your brewing yeast. The bread yeast is gonna be boiled to inactivate it, thus making the nitrogen in that yeast accessible to your brewing yeast and helping your fermentation go smoothly. And lastly, in my spiel contextualizing this brew, sanitizing. I like to use a no rinse sanitizing solution called Starsan. It's great. You mix it up, you dunk all your stuff in it, you shake them off, you don't have to rinse it. It's sanitized so that way microbes from your environment are much less likely to get in your brew. However, you may not be interested in purchasing Starsan or another sanitizer just yet. Never fear. You can dunk all of your brewing gear in hot water, 160 degrees Fahrenheit or above, for about three to five minutes and that should sanitize it. Just make sure that temperature stays above 160 degrees in that vessel. The easiest way to do this is to bring a giant pot of water to a boil, let it cool for about 10, 15 minutes, and then dunk all of your gear in there for a minute or two. Alternatively, and I think possibly an even easier option, is to put all of your gear that's gonna touch your brew into the dishwasher on the sanitize cycle using no soap, no rinse aid, just in there on the sanitize cycle. It's gonna blast all of your gear with high heat and steam, thus sanitizing it in the dishwasher, so it can go right from the dishwasher into your brew room and be used to brew. Sanitizing is one of the most important things you can do to ensure the success of your brews, so don't skip this step. Anything that's ever gonna to touch your brew should be sanitized prior to use. All right, you ready? Let's get in here and make some cider. Here's the gear you're gonna need for this recipe. A knife, measuring cups, measuring spoons, prep bowls, a carboy or water jug, a siphon and tubing, a funnel, and bottles. If using crown cap bottles, you'll need crown caps and a capper. Optionally, you might want a mesh strainer. The ingredients for this recipe are one gallon of apple juice, the skins of six apples, one teaspoon of lemon juice, and boiled bread yeast nutrients. The yeast for this recipe will be USO5 ale yeast. This recipe begins with peeling some apples. And I decided to use a mix of apples so that way we get a little bit of nuance from each different kind of apple rather than just ringing one note of using a single apple variety. Putting the peels in here is going to give us some tannin contribution. And since this is a dry cider, it's gonna help round out the flavor profile a little bit more holistically. We're going to start by pouring out one cup of our apple juice. Half of that cup of apple juice is going to go in with our yeast that we're going to boil, and we're going to drink the other half cup. Bring that yeast to a boil in the apple juice, and that will destroy the yeast, therefore making them a nutrient for the yeast that we're going to use to ferment this. Next, we'll cut our lemon in half and we will strain out the juice so we can get one teaspoon of that lemon juice. You're gonna have a lot of juice left over, so put it in your freezer and save it for later. Once that bread yeast is boiled, give it a nice stir. That teaspoon of juice is gonna go right into our carboy. Then that boiled bread yeast solution goes right into the carboy. Many nice apple juices will come in a glass carboy like this, so go ahead and make use of it as a fermentation vessel. If you can only find apple juice in plastic jugs, it's perfectly okay to use that apple juice instead. Next, our peels go in, and we're putting all of those peels from the six apples in there, and you want them cut into strips because it'll make it easier to get them out later. Then we open up our yeast, and that goes right in on top. Take your lid, put it on, and then loosen it 
so that it can breathe. Because again, fermentation is gonna cause some off-gassing and we don't want pressure to build up inside that carboy. In the first couple weeks, feel comfortable leaving that cap on but loose. So that way gas can escape. And now when you're fermenting, you start out with quite a bit of sugar and a lot of that's traveling up on those gas particles. And so some of that can gum up the threads of your lid. So you want to make sure that every day you're double checking that it is loose and pressure is not building up. After two weeks, you can start to seal the bottle, but every day, three or four times a day for that third week, you're going to want to make sure you burp it to let all the built up pressure out. Do not skip this step because if pressure builds up in a glass jug, you are destined for disaster. It can be not only dangerous, but also a huge mess to clean up. By the fourth week, off-gassing should really, really diminish. And really, after four weeks, you can be pretty certain at this ABV and with the yeast that we've selected, that fermentation is probably done. And that means it's time to get it into bottles anyhow. One last time, because I can't stress this enough, it is a safety issue. If you're using a glass carboy and you're using the cap to protect your brew, make sure you are regularly checking to make sure that pressure is not building up inside of the carboy. And a few weeks later, our cider is done fermenting. And you can see we've got a nice hazy, but still apple cider. We're gonna use one teaspoon of sugar per 12 ounce bottle to carbonate this. The yeast will eat that sugar and turn it into CO2, which will then go into suspension inside of that apple cider and carbonate it. We'll just pump our auto siphon a couple of times to get the flow going. And we're gonna fill it up with a couple fingers width of air at the top of the bottle. So don't fill the bottles all the way up to the brim. Use your hose clamp to stop the flow with about an inch, inch and a half of space at the top of each bottle. If you're using swing top bottles, you can just close them up right after this, but since I'm using crown cap bottles, I'm going to cap them with my capper. These will take about two to four weeks generally to carbonate, sometimes up to six weeks. So just put them in a dark place, set a reminder for, you know, a month to six weeks to come back and check on them and then serve chilled. And I gotta say, this is my favorite dry apple cider that I have ever had. And that's saying a lot because I've had a lot of apple ciders, but there's just something about this process using the hazy apple juice and using the apple skins and that just little touch of citric acid from the lemon that really ties this thing together. All right, it's been about six weeks. Let's go ahead and open this cider up and have a taste. And we're serving this dry. If you prefer a sweeter cider, you could back sweeten with a non-fermentable sweetener like erythritol. That works really well. Just sweeten the taste and then prime and bottle just like this video demonstrates. Or you can sweeten it in the glass with simple syrup or grenadine so you can sweeten the taste when you pour. As you can see, it's very effervescent. Lots of bubbles jumping up from the bottom of the glass and a nice little foam on top. It's a little bit hazy, just like the juice we started with. If you gave it some more time, it would probably clear just fine in the bottle. You get just a little bit of fresh apple, nice like rich red lunchbox apple, but there's definitely a nice fermentation funk in there. It smells like a nice farmhouse cider. Let's give it a taste. It's dry. Just a little bit of pucker. The citric acid from the lemon kind of elevates all those flavors to give it just a little bit of freshness. It tastes like an off-the-shelf cider. And the tannin from those uh, peels really helps elevate that in a way that if those weren't included, I think you would miss some of the nuance of the apple in there. That is super good. It is tough to make really good dry cider at home. But I think this is a really good example of how you can use some really simple ingredients, grocery store ingredients, to make a well-rounded cider. And part of the benefit of doing it as a one gallon batch is it's relatively simple and affordable. Now you could do this as a five gallon batch, but that's a lot of apples to peel. 
If you enjoyed this video, I would encourage you to subscribe and ring that notification bell so you don't miss any of the upcoming content on this channel. And if you're a longtime cider maker, drop a comment in the comment section for beginners with some of the advice you have on how to make delicious cider at home. Until next time, happy brewing and cheers. Homemade brews and various artists, everything from me to rose. Big creation, fermentation, inebriation, doing the most.